again equal price at 115 and lower eight three seven let's put this price one in eight three seven okay DAX. Earnings season is in full swing and electric vehicle maker Tesla posted earnings as well. Posted a profit, in fact, even in the midst of the global pandemic. The positive quarterly earnings were the car company's fourth in a row, but chief executive Elon Musk still wants to grow the company, announcing it will build a new plant in Texas. For more on Tesla and on earnings, let's get over to Mike Bell. Mike, what do you think about you know, what is now a $300 billion company, Tesla. I saw a chart yesterday, um, I think from Dave Wilson in New York, that showed Tesla's market value not only eclipses that of other car makers, but the entire U.S. auto index and parts makers and the entire European auto and parts makers index. So this is becoming... You know, the, the, the size of Tesla is a phenomenon that seems disconnected to the business, even if you are looking at the future of what's possible. Yeah, and without commenting specifically on Tesla, what I would just say is, you know, we are looking through the market at the moment and trying to avoid overpaying for stocks where the PE multiple looks extremely stretched. And you see that in a variety of different growth stocks at the moment. Uh, and, you know, what, what I fear is that what's going on at the moment is that you've got a combination of COVID uh, causing beaten up stocks to, to be clearly somewhere that people are avoiding. And therefore that's forcing a lot of the money into stocks which are perceived as long-term structural gainers and winners and creating this kind of irrational exuberance and stretched valuations in certain pockets of the market. Um, so we think it's very important to avoid overpaying at the moment, given how stretched valuations are in some sectors and stocks. And so what has impressed you then, Mike, when it comes to the earnings season, or has there been nothing that has that is impressed in, in the search for companies that are that have been beaten up but maybe have then impressed with their resilience? What, what has uh, been your message so far from the earnings season? Yeah, I mean, one area which has held up reasonably well has been uh, some of the financials. They've clearly been taking credit provisioning. Um, but when we look at the non-bank financials, so some of the uh, sort of brokers, wealth managers, um, and asset management businesses, they strike us as reasonably valued businesses. Uh, they're not on crazy PE ratios, and they've clearly got exposure to an economic recovery if we get a vaccine and a pickup in the stock market. But also, if we were to see another leg downwards, they're businesses which aren't going to go bust. Right? So they've got that survivability, and they've also got the exposure to the upside without being on too stretched valuations. So those are the kind of businesses which we think look attractive at the moment. Do you need a vaccine? Um, do we really need a vaccine? Because it strikes me that we don't really have a very good vaccine for the flu and or many other viral issues. I can't imagine um, the optimism is as high as, as it looks in terms of market pricing. And Mike, I, I look at the reopening here in Germany of the economy. It seems to be doing fine. There's no vaccine, but you know we're also not New position, long position open on Euro at 115.837. So I opened long at, on Euro at 115.837. And the clear difference, as you say, is that Germany's rebound in economic activity has come without a pickup in infections, whereas in the U.S., you've seen a rebound in economic activity, but unfortunately it's come with a pickup in infections, which is now unfortunately turning into a significant rise in the number of people in hospital. Um, and with that, threatening that there may have to be further 
um, social distancing measures either imposed or voluntarily imposed by people who were worried about the hospital system uh, eventually filling up. Um, so when I look around the world at the moment, I feel optimistic about the areas where you're seeing a recovery and activity without a pick up in infections like parts of Europe and China, but more cautious on areas where you're seeing a pick up in activity, but it's coming with a rise in infections like in the US. Mike, thanks very much. Mike Bell, JP Morgan Asset Management, Global Market Strategist. Uh, Mike will be continuing his conversation with us on Bloomberg Radio. Uh, Matt and I will be uh, heading there at 9 a.m. UK time. So that's around uh, 45 minutes from now. So we'll certainly be uh, we'll certainly be focusing on that. A uh, lot of moving parts in the markets today. Really interesting earnings stories coming through from advertising to, uh, to food products. Uh, we will talk about some of these stories shortly. We'll also get into the chemical story because the chemical company Covestro is confirming its guidance for the year, but says uncertainty surrounding the pandemic remains high. We'll speak to the CEO, uh, Marcus Steilman. That conversation is coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the European Market Open. We are 19 minutes into a trading session that is broadly positive for European equity markets, up by four tenths of one percent. Uh, lifted in most markets, apart from the Spanish market this morning. The earnings story very much part of that. Uh, let's get to that now with Covestro, because Covestro says its business was hit hard in the second quarter, but the chemicals company says it's already seeing recovery in demand for some of its products. The manufacturer is confirming the reduced guidance it's already issued, but says significant uncertainty still remains surrounding the impact of the pandemic. Uh, joining us now, I'm pleased to say, for his first interview of the day is Marcus Steelman, who's the Covestro CEO. Marcus, very good to speak to you. So let me ask you about how things developed in the last quarter. Was the end of the quarter much better than the start? Give us the, uh, the profile. Yeah, Anna and Matt, uh, very good morning to you and good uh, to uh, uh, thank you for having me on the show and good uh, to talk to you again. So looking at the second quarter, I think uh, two things were actually absolutely important for us. We very consistently managed the crisis. 
And we also took uh, very active measures to also fight against the crisis. And that is what you then finally can see has led to the results of 125 million euro EBITDA for the second quarter, which was higher than the market expected. So what did we do? First and foremost for us important was health and safety of our employees so that we made sure that this is always guaranteed at any point in time. And that's also what is still and will be in the future on top of the agenda. Aside of that, we made sure that we did not let drop any of the customer orders. So we made sure that there was no interruptions in the supply chains. We made sure that we also adapted our production output very flexibly to market demands. We had a very strict focus on our cost development and for sure we safeguarded our liquidity position. So all in all, that was then um, surrounded by April being the month that what was hit the hardest by the pandemic. And since then, we have seen sequential improvement in May as well as in June. And I can also say that that trend has actually continued in July already as far as we can say, say months to date in the numbers. So that as of today, in terms of volumes, we are just slightly below previous year levels. What kind of growth, Marcus, do you expect, and I wonder, you know, across regions, because uh, here in uh, Europe, the Middle East, Africa is your, your biggest region, region. If you look at EMEA, uh, APAC, and then NAFTA in that order, but the growth that you get from Asia, at least, you know, over the last three years, uh, run rate seems to be stronger than anywhere else. You have extensive experience. I believe you've even lived in China for a few years. Do you expect that to continue to be your growth leader? Well, actually, I lived eight years in China, and that's why I have some insights about the region and how the region is developing. And if you dive a little bit deeper, you can say that the economic wave actually has followed the pandemic wave, and Covestro is surfing this wave, wave very well, I have to say. So what we see is that China came uh, out very strong and first. And if you see the growth in Asia-Pacific uh, overall uh, and look, more in detail into it, you see that China in the second quarter has grown by 5% in terms of volume. That means the rest of the region actually uh, has declined by more than 30%. So China is definitely the growth engine for the second quarter and is followed by Europe and also North America in that context, as I said, with sequential improvements. So overall, I have to say that China is the growth driver, and I also expect from all I can see that China will continue be, to be one of the growth drivers of our business also in the future to come. And if you look at this, we are very well strategically positioned because we have in all three regions assets that independently are able to serve the respective customer demands, customer demands from the region uh, towards the region. And that is one of the strategic advantages that Covestro has. I've spoken to you in the past, Marcus, about the, the circular economy and about moves towards that. And we talk about uh, environmental issues and, and we ask guests sometimes about whether they've been put to one side, given the current fight has been all about coronavirus. Uh, has this had an impact on, on the sort of environmental agenda at Covestro on moves towards a, a circular economy? I have to say not a single bit. We have just confirmed and developed a new vision, which is we will be fully circular as Covestro. And what does that concretely mean? So we will move away from fossil fuel-based raw materials and ensure that we have renewable carbon sources for all the materials that we are manufacturing. Secondly, we make sure jointly with partners in the entire value chain, and that goes from suppliers to our direct customers, but also towards, for example, big retailers who are bringing our products to end consumers to ensure that we really run all materials and everything that we bring to consumers, that we run it in circles and move away from a linear economy. Thirdly, we will make sure that all the energy we need, and we are a big energy consuming industry and big energy consuming company, will be replaced from fossil fuel based energy sources towards renewable sources. And last but not least, we're also making sure that this is fully integrated in terms of getting a better competitive position. And all of this is still running at full steam despite the current massive crisis that we are seeing. I want to ask about the automotive industry, um, clearly a big part of your polycarbonates business and a big part of the German economy as well. What kind of recovery do you expect um, for automotive in Q3, Q4? 
I believe that we will see a very different picture. So first and foremost, I think we will see some slight recovery, but we must not forget that we have across the globe very different inventory situations. For example, in Europe, as far as we have understood the market, we see that there's still a lot of finished goods. That means produced cars from the first and second quarter sitting on stock. That means whenever there's pickup in demand from end consumers, those cars still have to be sold off. The second topic is in China, I can clearly confirm that what is sold from us into the industry is real demand because there is little uh, to few cars really sitting on stock. So what consumers buy has to be produced. And in the US, we have a mixed picture. Plus, we're seeing a clear shift now and a clear pickup in demand, predominantly in the hybrid, but also electrical propulsion uh, system and cars. And that is where Covestro is significantly um, uh, well positioned. Uh, you just mentioned Tesla earlier in okay. your reports, and we also collaborating with Tesla. Okay, Marcus, thanks very much for joining us. Good to speak to you. Marcus Starman, the Covestro CEO. And that takes us nicely on to what is coming up next on the program. Tesla's soared more than 500% in the past year and has had its fourth positive quarterly earnings. But Musk is still eyeing further expansion. More on the Tesla story next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the European Market Open. 30 minutes into Thursday's trading session, we are to the upside, but only by three-tenths of a percent here for European equity markets. U.S. futures, though, point up by a similar margin and, uh, in fact, higher 
on the NASDAQ futures. They're up by around nine-tenths of a percent. Let's get to some of the individual stories that are moving markets right now. We've got, uh, we've had numbers from a host of corporates, including Daimler. That stock up by 3.7 percent right now. Uh, Daimler targeting profit after weathering the worst of the virus crisis is one of the headlines coming through from the automaker. Uh, let me also tell you what's going on with Publicis. The share price there, an incredible rise of up by 12.6 percent. It's been higher than that this morning. It's also taking others in the sector higher. WPP also goes higher. And it seems to be the U.S. business and a shift in strategy there. Some wins for Publicis in the U.S. that seem to have uh, pleased investors. And Unilever, also a strong story today. It was up as much as 8 percent earlier, now up by 6.8 percent in the Dutch listing. Uh, all of this really due to the sales numbers which, yes, took a hit, but were not as badly hit as uh, analysts had anticipated. The CEO of Unilever, Alan Jope, told Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Horden how the company handled the coronavirus pandemic. What we've seen in the last quarter is the true strength of Unilever. Our breadth of our portfolio gives us good resilience. Uh, we've shown agility on how to uh, respond to these unprecedented circumstances. And meanwhile, we've been working on the strategic future of the company. We're long past the stockpiling phase now in North America. And what we're seeing is big shifts uh, from category to category. So things like hand hygiene, surface hygiene, growing very quickly. Um, and I think a lot of our growth in North America has been driven by our in-home foods uh, business as people uh, eat meals at home rather than on the go. And that's likely to continue uh, for quite some time. On the other hand, our business that supplies restaurants, of course, is um, struggling in the current circumstances. I think a lot of people were surprised at how well ice cream like Ben & Jerry's did in North America, given the fact that a lot of tourist concessions had to be shut down. Do you think ice cream and other sort of uh, businesses that you um, supply to restaurants, are they going to recover in the second half as more cities begin to reopen? You know, um, there's a number of consumer behavior changes that we're seeing through this pandemic. Uh, people cocooning at home as a safe space, people worrying about value. Um, but one of the things we're observing is, is eat everything. So we're all uh, shopping online, we're paying online, we're browsing online, we're consuming media online. And uh, can you believe it? Our ice cream team have managed to pivot from selling out of home on the go ice cream to take advantage of the boom in home deliveries. And so a lot of the growth that we've seen in, uh, in ice cream is people enjoying uh, ice cream at the end of a meal as part of a home delivery service. That's a, that's a trend that we expect to continue. And I also want to make the point that as we sit in Western Europe and our bubbles in North America, we must not lose fight, sight of the fact that this disease is still ravaging through the global south. It's a full steam in Latin America. It's getting a grip in Africa. It's having a devastating impact in some parts of uh, South Asia. So uh, I think we just need to be conscious that people are uh, suffering around the world. Yeah, that, of course, it's a very good point and a lot of humility you need to bring when you're discussing um, the impact on the changes of behavior. When you look at those changes of behavior, is there anything you could really harness to maybe create new brands for no stay for more stay at home meals? Is there anything you think your this pandemic means you're going to either have a, look at other brands you can potentially acquire. Uh, how does this change your portfolio going forward? You know, one of the things that we've seen, Amory, is uh, big brands, traditional brands, are doing very well indeed uh, in the current circumstances. Now is a time when people are uh, feeling insecure and the trust that they have in big, well-known brands um, is uh, of even greater importance. Um, we will, of course, be continuing to look for uh, opportunities to acquire. In fact, in, the, in this quarter, we completed the largest acquisition Unilever has done for quite some time, acquiring into healthy nutrition uh, with the Horlicks and Boost brands that are mostly in South Asia. So we will continue to uh, engage in the acquisition process. But at the moment, the real news is the strength of the well-trusted, big, familiar brands. You also talked about your tea business in the latest report. You're actually keeping some of the tea empire in-house, but spinning off the, uh, some others. Um, and what other M&A do you think is potential this year? Or is the industry, uh, is it even maybe too far-fetched to think the industry can really do more M&A in this kind of crisis environment? 
I would say our uh, position in M&A hasn't changed over the last six months. We're very uh, disciplined on looking at strategy, price, and timing. And if good opportunities um, emerge, then we are certainly in a strong position with our uh, very healthy balance sheet uh, to take advantage of that. Um, the other thing that we've been uh, working on is in the last quarter, we've announced our intention to uh, unify the company, uh, simplify the legal structure of Unilever, and uh, further down the road, that could give us opportunities to look at uh, more transformational acquisition, though I want to stress there's nothing of that nature on the immediate radar. And that was Unilever's CEO, Alan Jobe, speaking to our very own Anne-Marie Bourdain. Now let's get the Bloomberg First Word news. For that, we go back to London and Laura Wright. Laura? Thanks, Matt. China is vowing to retaliate for the U.S. ordering the closure of the U.S. consulate in Houston. It escalates tensions between Washington and Beijing already under heavy strain. The editor of the Communist Party's Global Times newspaper tweeted the Chinese response will cause the U.S. real pain. The South China Morning Post reports China may close the U.S. consulate in Chengdu. Global cases have topped 15 million of the coronavirus. The U.S., Brazil and India are the three worst hit countries and account for nearly half of all confirmed infections and more than 40% of fatalities. Texas has reported its biggest daily increase in deaths, but pressure on hospitals seems to have leveled off in some major metro areas, including Houston. Italy is targeting 25 billion euros of extra spending to rescue the economy hit by the coronavirus pandemic. A senior official says the government has approved the plan, which now goes to Parliament. Bloomberg's been told the extra money will be used to help businesses and provide subsidies to local authorities. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg Matt Anna. Laura, thanks very much, Laura, right there in London. Now, Tesla has managed to stay profitable even in the midst of the global pandemic. The positive quarterly earnings were the car company's fourth in a row, but Chief Executive Elon Musk said he still wants to grow the company, announcing Tesla will build a new plant in Texas. Joining us now is Amrendra Sinha, Quintet Private Bank, Head of Direct Equities. Amrendra, um, and Render, what do you think about um, the growth prospect of Tesla and really the likelihood that it joins is added to the S&P 500? Yeah, morning, Matt. We think uh, the growth prospect of uh, Tesla is really quite strong going ahead. Um, it's still really just transitioning from a startup business uh, with only 0.5 penetration really of EVs globally. We think there's a very long runway for growth. Um, with the S&P, we think that it now qualifies with regards to all the boxes. And now we think the committee will probably let the, um, the company into the S&P probably within the next few months. You think it's going to get into the S&P in the next few months? I'm Andrew, good morning. That is interesting. I, I suppose that plays into the valuation conversation, doesn't it? Because you don't have to be a cynic about the technology. You don't have to be a cynic about the move to EV to still think that Tesla looks overvalued. What, how do you weigh up enthusiasm for the underlying product, enthusiasm for the, for the fact it doesn't have any marketing and all those other selling points, but still a concern about, about valuation? Yeah, I guess the biggest sort of concern people have with Tesla is, it is the valuation. And, and, you know, it really does depend on if, if you believe we are transitioning towards an electric autonomous drivetrain for, for our cars. And if you do believe that, then Tesla's the leader and looks rather similar to Apple back in the day in the smart, you know, its position in the smartphone. At the time, there was very similar conversations going on around Apple uh, when it entered the smartphone business, Nokia being dominant. Um, obviously, a decade later, we know what, what's happened. Very similar sort of arguments were made for Amazon as well a, a decade ago as it was starting its build out of online retail. We think a very similar sort of process is occurring with Tesla. And we think over the next decade, the valuation will work its way through as the revenues and profits come through. Um, man, it just looks huge. I mean, Dave Wilson yesterday uh, showed a chart. It was his chart of the day out of um, the Bloomberg offices in New York where Tesla's valuation, I mean, it, not only is it worth more than Volkswagen and Toyota put together, but it's worth more than the entire U.S. auto uh, industry index. That's the, the S&P 500 auto index in blue. We're showing a chart here. 
In yellow, you see the Stocks Europe 600 Auto Index. Tesla's worth even more than that. This includes parts makers. I mean, Amrendra, does it make sense that Tesla is worth that much? I guess the easiest way to look at this is just do the software side. So the autonomy, if you believe it, um, you, you know, you're selling to the consumer today a software for 8000 probably increasing to $10,000 per car. Um, no one has done a $10,000 consumer software business before. If they say make a million cars, which we think they may do in the next year or so, and you sell 50%, that's $5 billion of uh, software profits. If you put that on 30 times multiple, that's $150 billion. That's half the market cap of Tesla, but it's still growing at 50%. So really, that's not including the logistics potential of that, the energy business, and uh, uh, all the other potential innovations this business is going to deliver. So we think actually there's still it's the potential of Tesla that's driving it, not its current earnings. You really do have to look forward. And Renger, what about governance concerns? Because we live in a world where many investors will uh, filter stocks based on environmental issues, social issues. Obviously, the environment, Tesla would do quite nicely, but uh, social and governance issues. Are there concerns around maybe the unpredictable nature of management here? What is the company doing to take that on? Yeah, look, we think on an ESG perspective, uh, which is a key sort of uh, criteria for us, uh, uh, Quintet, we think it scores quite highly, actually. Obviously, the entire goal of the company is to transition to uh, sustainable energy. But on the governance side, we think the company has made good progress in addressing some of the concerns here. Um, you know, the new chair lady uh, at Tesla is doing a great job. And obviously, there's new uh, people have joined with Hero joining the board from Japan. And we think w what is happening here, the governance side is improving. And I think shareholders and, and investors are sort of going to um, see further improvements on that side. So we think the governance has improved significantly, actually. Amrendra, thank you very much. Amrendra Sina, uh, Quintet Private Bank Head of Direct Equities, giving us his thoughts on Tesla after those numbers sent shares up after hours. Up next, going green, European Union governments approved the most ambitious climate change plan to date. We'll get behind the numbers. Just how green is Europe's plan? This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to the European market open. Uh, 45 minutes into Thursday's trading session, which is broadly positive, up around uh, three tenths of a percent. A little bit of weakness, though, at the periphery, the FTSE MIB and the IBEX, both down by three or four tenths of a percent. Now, European Union governments approved the most ambitious climate change plan to date, with more than 500 billion euros of spending. EU leaders reached a deal on an unprecedented economic rescue plan and seven-year budget for the region worth 1.8 trillion euros. Almost a third of that is earmarked for climate action. Joining us now with more on the story, she's been digging beneath the numbers from Madrid, is uh, Laura Mian, our reporter for Bloomberg Green. Laura, good to speak to you. So talk us through then the green credentials. What are they really at this EU spending plan? That's right. So a third, about a third of uh, the money that European leaders agreed um, over the weekend uh, and, and, and reached the deal uh, in, the, in the late hours of, of Sunday, Monday morning, um, about a third of that uh, is earmarked for green projects. So we still need uh, to hear more from the EU leaders about the details of these plans. There are still no precise guidelines, guidelines of how that money will be spent. But we know the intention is there to spend it on green projects. Um, the European Union uh, and European leaders, uh, especially on the European Commissioner, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, have been talking about uh, the goal to reach climate neutrality in the European Union um, by 2050. And the intention is, uh, the idea is that these funds will probably be spent on things like renewable energy, increasing uh, the fleet of electric vehicles, new technologies such as hydrogen, etc. So there is uh, still little detail on what these 500 billion euros will be spent in, but there are some things we know. Uh, during the negotiations, there was a rebalancing of the 750 billion euro uh, rescue package for the coronavirus crisis. Um, so there was a, a balancing of the ratio between, between grants and loans, and some climate programs have been affected by that. So there are already uh, some, some analysts, some policy um, watchers that have been warning that maybe some climate policies could be affected. Um, there's a just transition fund that has gone for four, from 40 billion to 10 billion has been cut. Uh, so some warnings there as well, because this just transition fund um, was destined to help countries uh, that would struggle a bit more to transition to a greener economy. Um, so we're talking retraining workers, etc. cetera. Um, but still, uh, the size of the package is really big. We'll have to see on what it's spent. Another interesting thing about the uh, deal reached by European leaders is the fact that even uh, the money that falls outside of this uh, 500 billion euros uh, that will need to be spent in green policies, even all the other money um, European con countries will have to commit uh, to spend it in things that do no harm to the European Union's climate neutrality goal and to the ultimate goal of fighting climate change. I think we're seeing, I think um, the president of the European Council, Charles Michel, uh, was speaking, or, 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 or he was speaking and now Ursula von der Leyen is speaking, referring to um, how, how they're going to be spending this money and uh, promising that it will that they'll do a good job at it. Um, how do the EU's green spending plans compare to those in other regions, to the rest of the world? Um, so the European Union plan uh, and, the, and the amount of green spending in it makes it the world's greenest recovery fund so far. So again, uh, not just in terms of the money, but of the percentage of any coronavirus recovery funds that will go into green policies. Uh, so we have seen nothing like that in any other region of the world. In the case of the US, for example, there have been no specific uh, parts of uh, the trillion package uh, that, that the government, uh, that, that has been announced so far, that will be spent on green policies. Uh, in the case of China, we have seen some measures that are aimed 
at, for example, increasing the amount of uh, electric vehicle charger uh, chargers on Chinese roads, which would, which would increase the amount of, or the, like, you know, the the, the supply um, of of infrastructure for electric vehicles uh, in China as well. Some measures have been announced to increase uh, renewable energy projects and so on. But at the same time. We have seen uh, in China some other measures that would favor the installation of more more coal plants mm. and more uh, you know fossil fuel uh, installations as well. So overall, uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance is calculating that globally, before the European uh, package was announced, 54 billion um, globally had been announced for green policies, compared to 670 billion announced in policies that would support carbon-intensive sectors. Okay. Uh, Laura, really interesting stuff, really interesting comparisons there globally. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Laura Mian, our Bloomberg Green reporter in Madrid. Up next, do record savings slow growth and cap yields? We will put that question to Venram, Bloomberg's Markets Live currency and rate strategist. He joins us next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Markets. This is the European Open. We are 54 minutes into the trading day right now and looking at equity indexes that are up just about half a percent. Um, not huge gains, but definitely significant green arrows here. Um, joining us to talk about today's markets is Ven Rahm, Bloomberg's MLive currency and rates strategist. Um, Ven, let's talk first about what's going on here in terms of headwinds or risks, you've got the U.S.-China um, tensions escalating, and yet markets are rallying. What's go wh why is that? Morning, Matt. I think the markets have gotten, uh, gotten used to kind of uh, periodic erup eruptions in uh, tensions between the U.S. and China, and you can nowhere is that more clear than in the currency markets where if you look at the dollar, which has been bid for months on end now since 
um, since the start of the first quarter, really. Um, it, now, uh, it, it now has an offer tone that suggests that the markets are kind of glossing over this, even though it's a risk, it's a definite risk, uh, that the uh, that the relations could go downhill, the markets are not just fussed about it at the moment because they've taken they've seen all kinds of things happening on the U.S. China front. As you know, we have seen uh, tensions surrounding Hong Kong. We have seen, seen tensions surrounding the trade deal. So the markets are thinking this is just another ta tantrum by the politicians, and the markets are therefore taking it mm. on and uh, on the in the stride. Yes. Uh, ben, good morning. Let me ask you the question of the day. You've been talking about it on the, on the, on the uh, blog. Do record savings slow growth in cap yields? Because we've been looking at those charts that show savings uh, going higher. Morning, Anna. Yes, I definitely think that uh, record savings slow growth. Uh, because what's happening is very interesting. Because at the micro level, uh, investors are depleting their savings. But if you look at the macroeconomic level, there's been a, such huge savings glut, and in so mm. far as that, all that savings glut, glut can find a productive use for the economy, the economy will benefit. But given the risk cover scenario that uh, the entrepreneurs are in, there is plenty of credit, there's plenty of uh, savings chasing investments, but where are the opportune investments for entrepreneurs? That's not really clear yeah. with, the, with, with the shrinking demand. All right, Ben, thanks so much for joining us. Ben Rahm there, Bloomberg's MLive currency and rate strategist. That's it for the European Open. Anna and I are headed off to radio.
Beijing hits back, the consulate spat continues. There are reports that Xi Jinping may shut the U.S. consulate in Chengdu. Unilever's shares surge. Revenue comes in better than expected, fueled by customers buying hand sanitizer. We'll hear from the chief executive, Alan Jobe. And Russia's sales take a hit from the pandemic, but the drug maker says that they're recovering. We'll speak to the chief executive, Sivran Schwan, in a few minutes. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, the markets are still keeping an eye on what's happening, of course, in China. Uh, we're seeing a bit of movement when it comes to renminbi. If we bring the board up, so I can actually show you also what's going on in gold, you can see up some 0.2%, and then uh, a lot of market participants looking at the earnings results and actually European stocks gaining 0.5%. Now, let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news here in London is Laura Wright. Hi, Laura. Thanks, Francine. Global coronavirus cases have topped 15 million. The US, Brazil and India are the three worst hit countries and account for nearly half of all confirmed infections and more than 40% of fatalities. Texas has reported its biggest daily increase in deaths, but pressure on hospitals seems to have leveled off in some major metro areas, including Houston. Australia's budget deficit is set to hit a post-World War II record. The shortfall for the 12 months to next June will be around 132 billion US dollars, more than double what it was for the last year. That's according to the government's economic and fiscal update released earlier this morning. It comes amid a surge in spending to mitigate the impact of the virus on the economy. There's still some challenging times ahead, but we continue to make the decisions to provide support in the economy uh, and to business and to protect jobs as appropriate. We do have to get back into a situation where viable businesses pay for the wages of their employees out of their own income rather than having to rely on taxpayer-funded support. Italy is targeting 25 billion euros of extra spending to rescue the economy hit by the coronavirus pandemic. A senior official says the government has approved the plan, which now goes to Parliament. Bloomberg's been told the extra money will be used to help businesses and provide subsidies to local authorities. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg Francine. Thank you so much, Laura. Now, U.S.-China tensions escalate further. According to the South China Morning Post, China is moving to close the American consulate in Chengdu. Now, that comes after the U.S. forced the closure of its Houston consulate in one of the biggest threats to diplomatic ties in decades. Here's what some of our earlier guests had to say about the decision. A breakdown in relationships with China is obviously not a good thing. Whereas this is a surprising move against a U.S. A Chinese consulate general in the United States, it certainly fits within the fabric of a structural deterioration in the relationship. We have moved from a period of strategic cooperation with China to a period of significant, uh, you know, strategic competition. That's on every front. It looks certainly at the moment as though China is in the process of losing, you know, its most important external relationship if it's not lost it already. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we'll have to see what happens after the presidential elections in the United States in November. I think the, the Trump administration has been you know, stronger with China than any other previous administration in many years. And I think that that strength is, you know, in certain cases, very important to uh, uh, to, to be uh, demonstrated. If Pompeo thinks that this is going to change, quote, China's behavior, he is gravely mistaken. Statements like his and others very much weaken the hands of reformers in China. We expect this decoupling to accelerate over coming years, regardless of which party takes control of the White House. The number one priority we should have right now as Americans is being sure that our own house is in order. In other words, we keep pointing the finger at China, but really we've been naive in terms of how we've protected ourselves. So that was uh, the very latest uh, that we spoke to about some of our guests, uh, given what we saw over the last 24 hours. And frankly, this happened around this time yesterday, and it was pretty surprising to a lot of people. Now, today, the market shifts to a lot of earnings focus. So we heard from Unilever, we heard from Roche, we also heard from Daimler. Let's get the board up to uh, check you about what exactly is going on in those markets. So you can see the FTSE actually gaining some 0.5%. Uh, once again, the focus is actually on stocks climbing amid a pickup in earnings. The dollar slipping to its lowest level um, since January. Gold I'm placing in order to stop on euro at 115.857. So it's stop on profit 
for position I hold since this morning at 115.857. We do nothing and we sit and let the virus run around the world. We end up in a very dark place. Every business goes bust. And that's why we're not going to, we can't allow that to happen. And we should begin, we should shut down the country. That was, that was basically my argument. And, and I've made a you know, pretty bullish case that had we taken a hard shutdown, you know, we would have had a better outcome both economically and from a virus perspective. But you know, the good news is we're going to get through this. There's going to be a vaccine. I think that's a reasonably high probability event. There are a number of meaningful candidates. We're on the cusp, hopefully. Um, you know, I, I heard, uh, you know, from a, a trusted colleague, uh, he's on a board of a company with um, a, uh, a, a, called a Chinese VIP, he was on the board of one of the, the state-owned enterprises in China, um, and he was recently vaccined along with 40,000 other Chinese VIPs, uh, and if the Chinese government is in fact vaccinating the 40,000 most important or uh, high-profile citizens, you know, they're clearly pretty far along on developing a safe, you know, an effective uh, vaccine. So I think, well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was actually going to cite your letter to investors in March where you said thousands of people have or will soon become severely sick. And, you know, at the end of that... Position closed on the euro, 200 pounds profit. It did come for, you know, 150,000 people in a lot of ways. But Bill, can I ask you just a few questions about the environment now very, very briefly with brief answers because we're almost out of time. Are you thinking about relations with China and does that concern you? Of course. Um, you know, look, I think, uh, you know, a, a globally connected world is a better world and a more, you know, there's a bigger pie for all to share. Uh, and I think, you know, a breakdown in relationships with China is obviously not a good thing. At the same time, I, I do think I, I respect uh, the administration's, uh, you know, you know, China has been pretty aggressive on issues of intellectual property, for example. I, I don't know the specific details of the of the issues concerning the Houston consulate, um, but you know, you, you read in the press about document destruction, you know, burning, you know, documents in the in the courtyard, the consulate. It, it doesn't look good for China. You know, I have a lot. I have enormous respect for the Chinese. I think they've built an incredible country, economy. Um, but you know, like all of us, they're not perfect. And uh, you know, I think the, the Trump administration has been, you know, stronger with China than any other previous administration in many years. And I think that that strength is.